Hello and welcome to the Gifted Ed Podcast. I am your host, Megan McCarthy, Clinical Social Worker. As we prepare to kick off our third season and dive into our fourth school year of the Gifted Ed Podcast, we wanted to share some exciting news with you that our previous co-host, Angel Van Howe, has built her own practice and will continue to explore the world of giftedness through her company, Empathy Connects. We thank her for sharing her expertise of giftedness with us, and we wish her all the best as she continues her journey of working with the twice exceptional population. We are grateful for the opportunity to share this space with you today as we talk about the complexities of giftedness. Today is an exciting episode as we discuss gifted schools from an administrative perspective with Dr. Kirsty Montgomery. By the end of this episode, you'll have a greater understanding of how schools can address the complexities of educating gifted learners, a solid sense of what characteristics make a strong gifted school, and an idea of what challenges gifted schools face when educating the variety of needs of gifted learners. Dr. Montgomery is the head of school at the Avery Coonley School. She is a British-born educator and administrator. Kirstie is passionate about learning. Despite dropping history at secondary school on an account of it being utterly boring, she graduated with a BA in political science from Northwestern University and later an MA in social science, MA in history, and a PhD in history from the University of Chicago. As an educator, Dr. Montgomery has taught history at a variety of educational institutions, serving students from third grade through college, including the Illinois Math and Science Academy, Omniscope Academy, Oakton Community College, Northwestern University Center for Talent and Development, and the University of Chicago. She has presented at academic conferences across the globe and has published several articles, book entries, and publications, including Around the World in 21 Trumpets, a cross-disciplinary method for teaching the fundamentals of brass playing that has been adopted worldwide. Dr. Montgomery has most recently head of school at Lakeview Academy in Georgia. Prior to that, she led Northwestern's Osher Institute, where she was responsible for over 1,500 lifelong learners. When not on campus, Kirstie enjoys spending time with her husband and six children and pottering around on her John Deere tractor. Welcome, Kirstie. Thanks very much, Megan. We're excited to have you. So today's conversation, we'll be talking through gifted schools from the leadership perspective, which is a unique one because you're our first administrator on the podcast. So we're excited to have this conversation. Can you start us off with just kind of sharing some common characteristics of strong gifted schools? Yeah, I mean, there's... Not that many gifted independent schools across the country. Um, and when we think about gifted school leadership and the characteristics, we we have to think about are these schools dedicated solely to gifted education or are they a hybrid mix? Mm-hmm. But to, to be a strong gifted school that serves only the gifted population, you obviously need a cohort of students to make it successful, but you need... Um, dedicated educators who have mm-hmm. the training and background that um, that enables them to maximize learning for those students. You also need um, a dedicated facility mm-hmm. that supports that type of learning. So they're the they're the kind of characteristics. And obviously, finally, you need supportive families yeah. who are um, who understand the unique challenges that children face and understand the importance of embedding them in a program where they are surrounded by their peers. Yeah. And I can definitely see that the strong educator background um, and invested family, those two pieces jump out at me. Of course, facilities, but those two pieces jump out because that kind of feels like the heartbeat of any solid institution, um, but just ones that really understand the unique needs of gifted. The mission of the school keeps us focused, right, on what's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, we, our students are typically working at one grade level ahead. um, And that's across the board. Now, we, because of asynchronous development, we do have some students who, even though within the classroom that they're in, the teachers are able to differentiate, meaning they're able to kind of uh, deepen the understanding and the content for some students who who demonstrate um, a high level of uh, kind of competency. 
But there are some students where that's not enough. And we we have the ability to accelerate them. And, and acceleration for us means um, in math only. And it would mean that they we, we have math scheduled all at the same time for the lower school, for example, and they would for math only move up and take math potentially in a in a higher level grade. Um, we don't make those decisions lightly because accelerating a child, whether it's just for one subject or actually on very, very rare occasions, we would accelerate a child for, for an entire grade, um, has so many implications. What One of them, obviously, it can literally be the child is physically a different size than the other children mm-hmm. in the group, which can have implications, social emotional implications. There can be the obviously the maturity implications, uh, making friendship implications, and all of that stuff does impact their academic learning. Right? Yeah. If if kids don't feel safe and comfortable and belonging in a classroom with a peer group, then no learning is going to take place. So that that's a really important point. Um, when we do make those decisions, though, and it's always done in, in consultation with families, we, we use a very data-driven approach to it when it comes to the, you know, the kind of actual academic markers and benchmarks. And we, we are consistent in that because we don't want it to be a routine thing that just because somebody feels that their, their child, you know, should move up, because every child thinks, every parent, sorry, thinks that their child, you know, mm-hmm. quite rightly so, every, everyone, you know, thinks very highly of their children and their abilities, that they should move their child up. We have to be able to be very clear about the criteria in which we're doing that. Um, you know, one thing, for example, you mentioned social emotional. Another thing that, that maybe is not always considered is that for, say, a math acceleration, they have to be at a certain level in literacy. Right. Now, again, pe- people don't think about that. Right. Well, of course they do, because the problem solving abilities mm-hmm. in mathematics involves decoding words and, mm-hmm. and understanding, uh, y- you know, sentences and so on. So it is a big decision for us. And we we prefer to keep children in their cohort and use the, the skill um, of our, you know, very highly qualified faculty and staff to um, you know, individualize the learning experience for each child and maximize their potential that way. I want to the f- the first point you had made. I think um, really speaks to the asynchronous learning, right? And I think, and not that you're not gifted in every area. And I'm sure in the arts you see this because you might be have like beyond gifted math abilities, but writing or reading is is quote unquote typical development or exceptional artistic eye and and spirit, but then math is really difficult or what have you. I don't want to pigeonhole any profile, but I feel like that is something I feel like really hits for our middle school teachers especially. Yeah. And it seems like that holistic approach, right? Looking at the whole child, because I do, as we've talked about in previous episodes, really the perfectionism that we really have to make sure that we're putting kids in environments where they are experiencing failure. Because if we don't do it beyond eighth grade, it's it's tricky. Um, and sometimes it doesn't happen until high school. And, and that's that's the case there. But I feel like trying to find the balance of that, what did they say, optimal challenge, right? Where you're, you're challenged, but you're not out of your comfort zone where no other learning can happen, right? It can be a really tricky spot in balancing that with SEL needs, with academic needs, with, you know, just physical development. Because I think with the asynchronous learning, we also just have kids (laughs) who are maturing and developing at such different paces because that's what kids do. And so it's putting those two pieces together with some exceptionalities in a system. It's that's a a tricky spot to be. The kids are smart, funny, quirky, um, but most of all, they're motivated, right? They're mm-hmm. motivated to learn. They have curiosity, which is insatiable. Mm-hmm. And in other independent schools or environments that I've worked with, with one exception, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, the the students are there because they kind of have to be there. And, and that, there is a difference. Right. There is a difference, not just for Mm -hmm. those who work directly with the kids in the classroom, but obviously that trickles up to the administrators. Right. 
So that's, that's, I think, one difference. The other one I would say is goes more to the previous point, which is to do with expectations and understanding gifted giftedness. And I think that makes it slightly different because, say, you know, at, at, at previous institutions I've worked, the, there's been passion on the parental side for other activities. Maybe the passion spills over into athletics mm-hmm. or the passion spills over into other areas. I think if in, in this environment, the, the, the passion and interest, I would say, on the part of families tends to be more directed towards cognitive things. And that has its own, you know, kind of interesting set of challenges, mm-hmm. but it's certainly you, you it's less common to see that in a regular independent school, I would mm-hmm. say. I mean, of course at the end of the day, you send your child to school not to learn baseball, you send right. your child to school to l- learn how to read and write. But I think the heavy emphasis on outcomes is probably slightly accelerated in a in a gifted school than it is in a regular school the, the, just to go back and this is kind of I, I think this is a kind of important point I mean I, I always our, our kids are such passionate learners and I I want to instill and I want the teachers to instill I mean they're the ones that work with the students every day a, a sort of a, a love of lifelong learning meaning mm-hmm. a, a kind of not just the, it doesn't just stop when they leave here it doesn't stop when they go to high school it continues until they are retired and the probably one of the most impactful experiences I had that could be applied to this setting in a very sort of weird tangential way was my experience working with lifelong learners at Northwestern Mm -hmm. who were aged kind of 55 to 100 years old Mm -hmm. and every day you know even through the Chicago winters they would get up they would you know, take themselves off downtown or wherever the, you know, the two campuses in Northwestern. And there's no one ringing their parents saying, where are you? There's no one giving them grades. There's mm-hmm. no, there's no reason for them to be there other than they are motivated to learn. Yeah. And that is something I wish I could bottle it. I wish I could capture it. Yeah. And, and that's something that these students at gifted institutions, they, they have that mm-hmm. as well. They have this, this kind of, inherent motivation to learn yeah. and that's a that's an incredible thing so as a head of a private gifted school you wear many different hats and then have the additional layer of enrollment and admissions responsibilities i do wear a lot of hats but i have a, a fantastic team also wearing a lot of hats because this is not the job of one person alone and it's a job actually of an entire community yeah. to keep the school going one is my, if you like, chief, chief paper shuffler hat, as I call myself. Um, and the other one is a parent. You know, I have six kids of my own. Um, they obviously, you know, has made a, a, a huge imprint on my life. And I think about that every day when I watch these young people here at the school, because I remind myself every day, yes, they are extraordinary individuals. They're extraordinarily gifted in different ways, um, but they are children Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day. And I I remember that with every interaction I have with those students. I think the final thing is there are some unique hats that you do have to wear as a head of a of an independent school that you don't necessarily have to wear as a head of a a public school. Certainly a different set of challenges. I'm sure they have different hats that I don't have to wear. But one of, I think the big one that we have that's different, big two actually that we have is different. We we have a very personalized, if you like, strategic planning process, which is just Mm -hmm. dedicated to our school. It's not like a district-wide strategic planning process or statewide thing. It's, It's very unique to our school. That uh, is fundamental to the operation of the school because it's our roadmap of where where we're going. Mm-hmm. And we're in that process right now. We, we hope to wrap it up at the end of the year. The other hat is the fundraising hat. And we don't receive uh, tax dollars 
from uh, from the state. And so everything that we do, every uh, advancement that we make, every investment that we make in the school has to be funded through tuition dollars and auxiliary programs and donations. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. That, as I say, that's that's not unique just to to gifted independent schools. That's that's a problem for all independent schools. Um, but that's a part of my job that I embrace uh, because. I, I see it as us growing our community and we are a community um, and in order for the, the community to work, kind of everybody participates. So uh, that's, they're the kind of, if you like, the two literal different hats. But for me, the two most important hats are the students, our children mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, the mission of the school is what focuses us. Mm-hmm. And then what are some common challenges? I think for all gifted schools, it is balancing the expectations and maybe misconceptions about what gifted learners can do and achieve versus what actually ends up happening. In other words, the outcomes. And what I mean by that mm-hmm. is there is sometimes a, a misconception that gifted learners are gifted across the board in every single subject yes and and that that simply is not the case um and there is often uh asynchronous learning so they Mm -hmm. there are strengths in in some areas and opportunities for growth and support in others and so that that's a common challenge that we have to try and overcome yeah i think the other one more more on a enrollment and a kind of admission cycle perspective is dealing with the the just the word gifted in the first place because the word gifted has been kind of redefined over the years yeah. and and most even most recently and is misunderstood and often thought of as being almost like exclusive yeah. and denotes something that is kind of almost unattainable. Unattainable, yeah. And and that's a challenge that we face as as a gifted institution. Some, you know, some people have said, well, maybe you should change the word gifted. Maybe it doesn't actually actually denote something that's um, in the in the world of equity and um, inclusivity. Mm, yeah. It denotes something different. Yep. Um, but while you know, institutions and scholars struggle with that definition, including us, I think it's a a kind of a label that we have used to denote those students who have uh, the potential to achieve maximum learning. Yeah. And we think of it as a progression, as a kind of a talent development, rather than something that was kind of innately given to that child um, and that no other child may have. Yeah. So many of our previous episodes have really kind of like we, you know, have deep dive into a very particular puzzle piece, if you will. And I really appreciated today's conversation because I felt like we could kind of zoom out and get a full, not entirely full picture. We'd be here for hours, I'm sure. (laughs) We talked through every part of your job, but, but a larger puzzle piece of how everything has to kind of work together to give that student experience and family experience, educator experience, administrative experience throughout a school that spans from age three to, to eighth group. So I really appreciate you being here today. Thanks for having me. We want to thank you for joining us in this space today. Please subscribe to the Gifted Ed podcast to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Stay tuned for our next episode that continues to unpack the complexities of giftedness.